gentlemen. Thank you for uh, attending this evening. I'm Colin Durant. I'm a graduate student here in the uh, School of Mass Communications. And uh, th just a quick reminder before we get started, if you put your cell phones on silent, uh, it'd be much appreciated. This is now the fourth lecture in our new Media Visionaries lecture series. You know we've hit on some topics already of entrepreneurship, history of Silicon Valley, and design. Uh, tonight's speaker is truly a digital advertising pioneer. I'd like to welcome here to San Jose State University, Bruce Carlisle. He's currently the CEO and founder of Conference Hound, a San Francisco-based seed stage company dedicated to global discovery of conferences and trade shows. He's also the leader of Digital Axel, a specialized digital marketing consultancy. Bruce's career spans a broad spectrum of disciplines, including web publishing, digital marketing, advertising, PR, direct marketing, broadcast news and sports production, and for the last 17 years, digital marketing and e-commerce. I think if you have a question this evening about anything, he can probably give you an insightful answer. <laughs> He's a recognized leader in the field of digital marketing who's been published, interviewed, and featured in Fortune, Red Herring, The Wall Street Journal, The Industry Standard, CNN Business News, B2B Magazine, Advertising Age, among other outlets. And in the recently published book, Internet Ad Pioneers, the stories of the unsung people behind the birth and growth of the Internet ad industry, he's featured in one of the chapters. His list of accomplishments goes on. He co-founded and became the president and CEO of SF Interactive in 1996, which was recognized in 2000 as the fastest growing privately held company in the San Francisco Bay Area. Prior to launching SF Interactive, he had an 18-year career in advertising and corporate communications. He was director of online marketing at Working Assets, where he led their transition to the digital marketing age. This evening, talking to you about distribution in new media, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Bruce Carlisle. Thank you very much. I've, I've never heard that bio read out loud. It sounds really self-serving to me. Now, now, but but there's a lesson in there for for all of you at the at the end. Um, my uh, aside from the fact my mic's falling off. Um, the title of uh, what I'm going to talk about is Why Is Everybody Messing With Me? Uh, I've been in the advertising, marketing, media world in one form or another now for for 33 years, I guess. Um, and the one thing that is constant is change. And um, the pace of change has accelerated dramatically, even in the last two or three years. And so when I was asked to give this talk, I said, what should I talk about? And the basic uh, direction I was given was, was to talk about change and dealing with change. And how do you stand out in a changing environment? And really to help you guys think about how what you learned today and maybe what we talk about tonight can translate into making you relevant tomorrow. Uh, and that is a, a constant struggle for everybody. And as I was thinking about how, how is it that, that we should talk about this, uh, I kept coming back to this idea um, that, and I'm, I, I haven't looked it up, but I think uh, somebody like Winston Churchill said that, that history is about people um, and personalities drive a lot of what happens. So in this world where we talk about technology, and in fact, um, it's all been done by people. And so what I'm going to try and do tonight is interweave um, some stories about some people who, who have had a broad impact on the overall world of media market and, and more recently technology, uh, and people who, who at some form, uh, some time or another, and in varying degrees of, of knowledge and time, I've run across. And uh, I thought that would be an interesting way to go at this. And I'm not necessarily going to talk completely about things that are happening right now, but really just talk about how things change and how things uh, move forward because I, I believe the most important thing that you can come away with as you st sort of start going into whatever you're doing in media, marketing, teaching, uh, is, is to recognize change when it's happening. Because it, the one thing I've noticed is it has a way of sneaking up on you. And all of a sudden, what you've noticed and what you're doing, suddenly you're reading about it and you're going, well, I was doing that two years ago. And there's a lot of advantage to be had if you can recognize change when it's happening and try and define change when it's happening. 
So I'm going to talk about both people and trends intermixed in a couple of ways. And I was telling um, Calvin, who, who first got me invited to this, that um, preparing for this talk tonight actually was very helpful to me. I, I've been trying to figure out what to do in terms of documenting my experiences over the last 15, 20 years. And uh, you know, the, in my head, there's a book there somewhere. And I, th I think in preparing for this, I may have begun to got at what, that, what that's going to be about. The bad news is it's not a book yet. It's a little bit disjointed and disorganized, um, which is good news because I would invite you to make it even more disjointed by asking questions at any time, jumping in, argue with me. Um, I don't care. I, I like doing this stuff. So, so the more you guys talk, the more interesting I think this will be, at least for me anyway. Um, I'm going to start right here. This is 777 Third Avenue in uh, New York City, and it's where my first job was at Gray Advertising. And my first job was working on the launch of Aquafresh Toothpaste. And what that meant as the assistant media planner on Aquafresh Toothpaste is I came to this building every day, and on a gray, battleship gray desk was chained, with a one inch thick chain, a adding machine, because they didn't want me to steal the adding machine. And um, every day I would take these big, huge uh, pads of paper. They were about this wide and this deep, and they were spreadsheets. Before spreadsheets were spreadsheets. Before Excel, there was actually paper. And my job every single day, at least this is the way I remember it, probably wasn't like this, but I believe every single day I came in and I filled out 40 columns down and I filled out 20 columns across, and then I had to add everything up, down and across. It never added up the right way. And I, it would take me a day, two days to do this, at which point I would um, take this big, huge piece of paper to a blind typist whose job was to type all of these numbers onto another big piece of paper, which was about this big. And then we had a really fancy Xerox machine that was the size of a room that we would go put this big, huge paper on, and we would reduce it and reduce it and reduce it until it became 8.5 by 11. And then we would put it in the mail. And that was great, because three days, we didn't hear from our client. We didn't have to do anything. We started the next page. <laughs> and about a month after I got there, the world changed. Because suddenly, uh, some guy had figured out that if you picked up packages in New York and you flew them to Nashville or Memphis overnight and sorted them out there and put them on other airplanes to take them to Pittsburgh, where Aquafresh was, you could actually get that chart from New York City to Pittsburgh overnight. And I thought this was great. You would not believe the belly aching that I heard over and over again from the people who'd been doing this for five years and suddenly had to deal with their client calling them the next day. It, it was utterly, utterly disruptive and, and change-making, and it was with the oldest kind of technology. So. Uh, now I can look back and say, wow, that was a really, really big and disruptive change. I didn't really see it that way at the time. I just thought, well, okay, so now we can get it there tomorrow. But, but the important thing was not so much that it changed the way we did business, which it did, but it made people's heads explode. And that's the key, which is all these changes are all great and they're all lauded and stuff like that. Every disruptive change sort of in the way we live is making lots of people's heads explode all the time. And um, the way they did do things is no longer the way they are doing things. And so while that impacts people sort of in the real casual world, it really impacts people in the information worker world, which is ultimately what media and marketing are all about. And uh, a lot of these inventions, FedEx fundamentally changed the process of doing media plans for toothpaste. Um, who would have thought that that was possible? Uh, so, so again, you kind of got to watch and see those things happen. 
This is the worst idea I ever worked on. Um, and I was so proud of it at the time. We were working for a beer company named G. Heilman, which was a Midwestern beer company. They were rapidly going out of business, but they had one great thing going, which was Colt 45, which was the number one malt liquor in America. And I don't even know if it's still around, but it came in these big, huge bottles and big, huge 16-ounce cans before there were 16-ounce cans. And it turns out that um, malt liquor was very popular um, in low-income and African-American communities. And so, like any good marketer going out of business, G. Heilman said, well, we ought to make more of whatever stuff that market buys, because we're good at that. We know how to do that. So let's do that. Let's make a new product. And they gave us, I was working at an ad agency at the time, go make us a new malt liquor. The only thing we're going to tell you is it's going to be really, really strong. It's going to have as much alcohol as the law allows. And so we came up with about 20 different names. And we trotted them in a big bag up to a um, focus group facility, um, which happened sort of before everybody in the world knew what a focus group was. And we took them up to the South Bronx, which is a heavily African-American community in, in New York City. And we showed them all these concepts. And the winner, hands down, everybody loved it, was Power Master. And so like good marketers, we took that knowledge and said, all right, we got your name. It's Power Master. Go make a can. So they went and made a can. And somewhere along there, my conscience spoke up. And I thought, this is, doesn't sound, you know, there might be something wrong here. And I went to the uh, chairman of the agency I was working for. Um, and I'll talk more about him, named Jerry Delphine. And I said, you know, we could get in trouble with this thing. This, you know, alcohol consumption is hurting uh, minority communities. This might not be the best idea from a PR standpoint. And after a whole pile of discussion, uh, a, a, um, basically an argument with, with Jerry, he allowed me to say this to, the, to our client. So it was a throwaway line at the end of a the sentence. There are risks involved in putting this together. And the CEO, whose company was going out of business, said, yeah, 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 no problem. Let's launch it. And we launched it. And the next day, there were 15 ministers from South Chicago who, who had chained themselves to the desk at the reception area of the G. Heilman Brewing Company in Chicago. And um, it didn't surprise me one bit, and I was pretty ashamed of it. But, but the interesting lesson here is that everything was done by the book. We went out, we came up with ideas, we came up with a brand concept. We went out, we tested it amongst the right target audience. They gave us feedback, we took that feedback, we put a product out on the market, right? Nothing's wrong. Well, it turns out that this, this thing called the media and reality actually punctured its way in. And I like to think of this as being almost the very earliest kind of uh, uh, execution of, of sort of what happens today when the internet goes crazy over something. It was just um, uh, the community organizers took one look at the bodegas that morning and said, this is nuts, we're not going to put up with it. They got organized and the product was dead within six weeks. I said I'd talk about people. Um, I had the, the interesting, I was going to say good fortune, but I'd say I, I had the interesting fortune to have spent um, an evening getting hopelessly drunk with Ted Turner one time. And Ted Turner, if you don't know, was, was one of the great media moguls of the, the 80s and 90s. And as I'm sitting there working in uh, the media department of another advertising agency, Along comes Ted Turner, and suddenly he has taken cable TV. And by the way, cable TV started out as something to give people better reception when they didn't live near a TV station. That's why cable TV happened. And suddenly Ted Turner said, wow, that's a nice idea, but what I'm going to do is just take it all over the world. 
And he had this really crummy station in Chicago that ran nothing but reruns. And suddenly he sold this into every cable company around the country, and he had effectively created a cable network overnight without anybody realizing it. And because he was from Atlanta, um, and he owned the Atlanta Braves, he was essentially putting the Atlanta Braves on TV nationally, which was freaking out the networks, freaking out the local baseball teams. And my job was to buy media advertising for Miller Beer. And Miller Beer wanted to advertise on Ted Turner's channel with the Atlanta Braves, but they only wanted to pay for Atlanta because the money came from Atlanta. So had to go to Atlanta. We didn't care, right or wrong, about the rest of the world. Ted Turner is, he was also a very, very accomplished sailor. And he was going to get a big award from the New York Athletic Club. And he flies into New York. And he invites somebody from our ad agency to come hang out with him before he goes and gets this award. And since everybody knew we weren't going to buy the Atlanta Braves package for Miller because the numbers weren't right for us, it went from the top down to the second guy, down to the third guy. And finally, the last guy, they said, hey, would you go drink with Ted Turner? I said, sure, why not? And I went up to his office in the Gulf and Western building in Manhattan, and there's one other guy there and a couple of his, his people. The other guy is from the Nielsen Media Company. And not only is Turner trying to convince me that, he's cre that this really is a network, it was, but nobody was willing to believe it, he's trying to, he has to convince the Nielsen Media Company to count all the people who are watching the Atlanta Braves um, in Seattle and in Boston as actual real people who are valuable to advertisers. And so it turns out the reason I'm up there is so that he can spend two hours pouring scotch down our throats and lobbying us to recognize uh, the existence of this, this really weird alien idea called a cable network. And you know, the next year, he went out and said, I know what I'm going to do now. I'm going to start a 24-hour news station. And I can tell you, everybody in the advertising community just thought he was out of his mind. How could you put news on the air 24 hours a day? What would you fill all that time with? How much news could there be? Because until now, news was 22 minutes of evening news, and that was it. And he started CNN. And he became wildly successful with CNN. CNN was eventually acquired by Time Warner. Time Warner owns... Um, they own cable companies. They own lots of magazines, like Time. They own a movie studio, like Warner Brothers, and a big, huge media monolith. And Ted Turner, um, by virtue of that acquisition, becomes the richest man in America. Um, and he uses that money to become the biggest landowner in America. Uh, and he sits on the board of Time Warner. And then the dot-com world goes crazy. And this guy, Steve Case, comes along and convinces the chairman of Time Warner that, that AOL is worth about three times as much as Time Warner. And the, the fundamentals of that argument actually made sense at the time. People were willing to pay a huge amount of money for AOL, which had... 20 million subscribers and was growing quickly. Um, way more than they were willing to pay uh, Time Warner, which was in media all over the planet, everywhere. And so they merged Time Warner and AOL. And AOL, um, which made its, its money by getting people to subscribe based on a model where people pay $19 for dial-up internet service, all of a sudden just gets slaughtered as things like DSL and fast band internet comes along. And AOL is suddenly just hurting. And with it, they've dragged down this once proud, huge media empire. Uh, everybody's uh, pensions are in a mess. Ted Turner's no longer the richest man in the world. In fact, he'd promised $50 million to the UN. He had to take that back. Um, and 
The last, Steve Case didn't do anything wrong. He convinced the chairman of, of, uh, of Time Warner that his company was worth more, and he had the public price to prove that because people were willing to pay that. People were willing to pay that because they'd been sold a myth about the sort of evergreen nature of the growth that AOL was going to have. At the end of it all, this guy who's absolutely one of the biggest media visionaries in the world, what's he doing today? He runs a chain of um, buffalo steak, sa sandwich steaks, uh, steakhouses all over, the, all over the West. And another example of somebody absolutely brilliant and uh, a, a real, by any standard a great business person, not necessarily the greatest, nicest person, um, sort of allowing the financial people and the financial model to take over, and he ends up running a fast food chain. And I think it's kind of, kind of instructive of, of, of how things can change. And this really happens, you know, sort of, I guess, around 2001, 2002 is when the AOL Time Warner thing really blew up. And, uh, you know, he, he put a lifetime of work into this thing. And basically, he didn't lose it all. And nobody's, nobody's losing sleep over him. But it's, it's instructive. Um, she was my boss when she was a mid-level um, management supervisor at an agency I worked at called Ogilvy and & Mather. And it's a very short story, but, but one of the questions here is, how do you sort of create your own personal brand? And how do you, how do you what are the values that you can, you can identify with yourself consistently, consistently, no matter how much the financial or the media or the marketing landscape changes? My job was to work on creating a TV commercial um, for, I, I think it was uh, some sort of international travel club that American Express had put together. American Express was our client. And this was a classic case of the emperor has no clothes. We went off, we came up with a concept. We went to American Express, they said, shoot it. We got $200,000, which was a huge amount of money, shot this commercial, Lots of bagels and lots of stuff to eat. Um, we brought it back. We all looked at it. We all said, this is great. We took it to American Express. They said, great, run it. And the last trap before this thing went on the air, and it was supposed to go on the air within 48 hours, is we had to show it to Shelly Lazarus, who ran the account. She walks in. She takes one look at the commercial and and picks up the phone and calls Lou Gerstner, who was then the chairman of American Express, later the chairman of IBM, and says, hey, Lou, we just blew it on one of these commercials. This thing's not going to run. Just want you to know. And it was one of the most sort of stunning things I'd ever seen before and since. Because we, were also, we couldn't say the thing wasn't any good because the money had already been spent and it was supposed to be on the air tomorrow. So it just behooved everybody to run along, get along, and say, this thing is going to be great. And along comes somebody who just says, uh-uh, forget it, not going to happen. And six years later, she was the chairman of Ogilvy and Mather Worldwide. She leapt over about 20 men who were sort of ahead of her in line. Um, she went on to become one of, you know, named one of the top ten most powerful women in business. And um, I don't know that she knew anything more than anybody else. I don't know that she was any smarter than any of those people. But people knew what she stood for. And um, of all the sort of moments I've had in my career where something has come along and just sort of hit me in the face, that one rings true the most. And And... That experience is utterly technology neutral. There's another guy I work for, the complete opposite of Shelley Lazarus, um, but way more fun. Uh, <laughs> how many people have ever heard of this guy? Oh, that's pretty good. So um, Jerry Delfamina grows up in Brooklyn. Um, lower middle class, becomes, I think, a copy editor at the New York Times. And at the time he does this, it's very much a madman world. The advertising world is, is a closed club. 
It's very waspy. Um, without the right school, the right connections, believe it or not, you can't get into advertising. Today, it's quite a different story. Um, and he basically just does whatever it takes, outrageous or not. His first big deal is he's working on a pitch for the Sony, um, for, for Sony TVs, I think. And he comes up with a line that be later became the title of a book called From the Wonderful Folks Who Brought You Pearl Harbor. And um, actually goes to Sony and says, you ought to do this. And they throw him out of his office. But it turns into a headline article in the business section of the New York Times. And he's off and running. Um, I always said I learned how to do things right at Ogilvy and Mather. And I learned how to just do things uh, um, but from this guy. His deal was he would reinvent himself constantly. He would say anything as long as it got attention. Um, and he loved nothing more than to have a really good controversy that he created. And um, I'll tell you one, one little story about his, how he influences the media, because this goes on quite a bit, and even more so today. I was involved in a nonprofit TV commercial for an anti-littering group in New York City. And we went out and got David Lynch, who's a very kind of scary, edgy director, or at least he was, and said, do a, do a TV commercial to us, for us about littering. So he does a TV commercial, and it's got rats crawling all over litter, and it's just disgusting. And we take this to um, the people at the anti-littering group, and it's sort of the same emperor has no clothes thing. Everybody likes it. But one guy retired chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank or something, says, you know, I showed this to the cardinal, and the cardinal didn't really love it. And he was talking about, I forget the name of the cardinal, the cardinal of New York City at the time, the, of the Archdiocese of New York. And just in passing, I, Jerry, I come, go back, and, I, and Jerry says, how did the meeting go? I said, it went fine. You know, Don said something about the cardinal. He goes, hmm, Okay. Next morning, I wake up, I get my New York Post, and blazoned across the top of page six, which is the gossip page, is this thing that says, Cardinal so-and-so hates the rats ad, um, and, and all of a sudden, I've got the guy calling me saying, hey, did you leak that in the New York Post? I said, no, I didn't leak it in the New York Post. I go, Jerry, did you leak that in the New York Post? He goes, how'd the Yankees do last night? <laughs> <laughs> Never answered the question. Um, I think I know the answer. But um, the, the lesson he taught me with respect to media is, is be willing to take chances and, and go out there and if you, either you think something right is right or you have to do something to, to get attention, just go do it and worry about the consequences and deal with them later. And I never, ever could have become an entrepreneur starting companies if I hadn't seen this guy go out on a limb and be willing to fail and jump off of cliffs all the time and wake up laughing. This is a story of constant reinvention. Um, this guy right here is a guy named Andy Serwer. I was a summer camp counselor. Um, at a camp in Maine. And we went our separate ways. He went off to college. And then one day, my mother calls up and says, hey, you know, Andy lives two blocks away from you. And turns out Andy is now a reporter at Fortune magazine. And sometime around, like, 1996, he's gone off. He's been a reporter. And he does the boring reporter thing. Andy starts writing a blog. And there isn't even a word yet for the term, for the term blog. He's just writing an online newsletter that goes to everybody under Fortune's name. And he keeps doing that. And then one day we wake up, and Andy's all over television. And the reason he's all over television is because he's the only guy at Fortune who is willing to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go on to Channel 1 in New York. And he said, OK, I'll do it. And suddenly, he's a TV star. 
And then Fortune and all the other magazines at Time Warner start to get in real trouble because this thing called the Internet comes along and it's uh, disintermediating and it's changing their world. And they have this world of print magazines. They have nothing going on on the web. They have nothing going on with televised or broadcast media. And lo and behold, I open up the Wall Street Journal one day about five years ago, and Andy has jumped over everybody at time, and he's now the managing editor of, of Fortune magazine worldwide. And the reason they picked him, this is what the article said, and this is what he said, is that he was really one of the first transmedia personalities. He's one of the first guys who, who just kind of, and, he, and I don't think he had any master plan to it. It's like, oh, I can talk to more people if I start writing a blog and send a newsletter. If I go on, even, even if I have to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I can reach more people with my ideas and my concepts. And that seems sort of intuitive to everybody today, but it wasn't necessarily intuitive then. And I don't know what's going to come next after blogging, but I do believe that as new things come along, that if you just pick them up and try them and you start to get good at them, opportunity is, is maybe going to knock right around the corner. Um, this guy I, I've met, but I don't really know him, but he's in the news constantly now. Uh, you're, you all know what Zynga is? So Zynga is a gaming company that basically lives on top of Facebook and comes up with things like Farmville and Words with Friends and all this kind of stuff, and it takes off like a total rocket ship. And investors go wild. Wall Street goes wild, goes public. It has this massive valuation. This is really even before Facebook. But it's all predicated on this idea that people are going to pay forever and, and the growth is going to be forever for little virtual animals and stuff like that, which you can't even believe at the beginning it's going to happen. Now, having said that, you know, they've made a billion dollars. Um, now this company's in real trouble. He's in real trouble. He might lose his job. They just announced they're cutting a lot of, a lot of their uh, people. Um, but, but how he got there is interesting, which is that the financial community told him this would scale forever. And the engineers and, and told him they could keep making new games and people, people would keep buying them. So he went out and told stockholders and investors that story. And boom, all of a sudden it turns out People are not going to endlessly buy virtual plants and palm trees and cows and stuff like that. And it further turns out that everybody else gets into this. So as soon as you start charging people for things now, they just say, hey, I'm done, I'll go get another game. And so uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see, see what happens. They still make a fair chunk of change. But it's also conceivable that this, what seemed like a brilliant idea two years ago, could in fact just wither up and go away. And I've seen that happen over the last 15 years um, with all kinds of technologies that were either, they, some of them were too early for their time. There was a product called the Newton, which was fundamentally a, you know, a pretty decent kind of uh, um, super phone or, or uh, kind of like a Palm Pilot. And it was made by this company called Apple. Total failure. No lines around the buildings waiting for people to get in. Trashed in the media, dead within a year. Um, and yet, the actual concept was really, really good. It's just the execution and timing were really off. Whoops. So one of the trends in both media and marketing uh, that has has sort of reached a tipping point, in my view, is the idea of segmentation. So, you know, when I'm sitting in a building trying to figure out how to market toothpaste, as I was at the beginning of my career, I need to figure out who buys toothpaste. Well, it turns out housewives buy toothpaste and that they're aged between 25 and 45. And so we segment the market and we try and find media that reaches it. And that all seems pretty benign. Where we are now 
is that markets have become so segmented and so fragmented to the point where people can market to you on, on literally a one-to-one -one basis. It's not just your zip code anymore. They can send you mail based on what you eat and what you believe. Um, how many of you use uh, like a, a grocery store discount card, like a Safeway card? All right, all of you. So you know what? Every, Safeway knows everything you eat, and they know how many six packs of beers you've bought in your life, and they know how much bacon you've had. And if, if they were less than ethical, they could sell that to your insurance company uh, and, and your, your rates might rise. So segmentation was kind of a nice way to target media dollars and a nice way to target media content. I, I draw a line between that and fragmentation, which is what we have today, which is everything's blown up all over the place. And what that means is that First off, on a broad cultural basis, we, have, we don't have shared experiences the way we used to. Uh, as an example, um, Calvin asked me walking over here if I saw the Giants game last night. Well, 15 years ago, everybody would have seen the Giants game because 70% of the people would have been watching it. Now I'm like, oh, yeah, there was a baseball game last night. Uh, yeah, there was a debate last night. I didn't see either one of them. Um, and the world's become that much more fragmented. And... The sort of corollary to that is there used to be a saying that said, um, you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your facts. And I'd submit that we're living in a world now where you're actually entitled to your own facts. How else do you explain these two women, both Stanford graduates within six or seven years of each other, um, and I don't know, I assume you recognize who they are. Rachel Maddow, who is a, a bona fide lefty, and Gretchen Carlson, who's on TV every morning. They come through the same tube. They have the same general education and background. And they have a set of facts that underlies their reporting that is just diametrically opposed. I mean, it's, it's, they're not even agreeing on the basic um, the, the basic fundamentals of whatever it is they're reporting on. And that's, that's where fragmentation leads us, both in, in sort of the general media and in terms of marketing. Um, there's a school of thought that says, you know, five to ten years from now, the idea of walking into a store and picking something up off the rack that's maybe a medium uh, or a large or a size 10 or a size 2, forget it, you're just going to, send your own personal measurements and, and you're going to get something in the mail two days later because manufacturing is that simple. Um, so, so there are both benefits and downsides to this fragmentation. One of the things that happens because of fragmentation, ironically, I think, is that power becomes concentrate, more concentrated rather than less concentrated. And um, this guy, Mark Halperin, who, who I met because my ex-wife decided I needed somebody to play with and invited him over for dinner a bunch of times. Um, I don't know how that worked out. But anyway, um, Mark Halperin comes up with this idea of the Gang of 500. And the basic premise of the Gang of 500 is that there are really 500 people who matter in the world. And, and that their opinions, whether expressed through media, through their business activity, um, are, are what drive the discussion, drive the debates, not just in America, but around the world. Um, and the membership of that group of 500 is self-selected. In other words, the people who are in the Gang of 500 pick the people who are in the Gang of 500. They throw people out. There's never an actual election. There's never an actual meeting. It just kind of, kind of happens. And I believe that is also the direct result of fragmentation, because now you have people with these, the, the people who are in this have some sort of platform, whether it's a Senate seat or a TV show or a big business that allows them to get, get up and, and, and make noise about it. Um, so I think that's an interesting uh, trend. This one is, is the hardest one. I couldn't find a picture for it. But um, it, going back to sort of my experience at Gray Advertising when FedEx comes along and how it just utterly confused people. Well, now that's happening really, really, really fast. You can come out of college in 2003 and learn everything there is to know about Internet marketing 
and be useless today if you haven't really kept up with it. Uh, I have a, um, sadly worked with a guy for a while uh, who worked for my consulting firm, and, and what he was was an internet media buyer, and that's what he loved to do. That's, that's what he knew how to do. And as we were doing that, suddenly more and more of the clients we had started asking for uh, internet search marketing instead of media buying distinction. And this guy refused to deal. He said, no, no, I do media buying. I don't do search. That's, that's just like some little thing down there that's beneath me. Well, and I kept saying, I don't know. I think it's going to be a big deal. Um, it t <laughs> turned out to be a big deal, and he's now living on his father's trust fund in Jackson Hole doing nothing related to the Internet because he allowed himself to um, just get passed by. And he wasn't really intending to do that. He didn't. It's really hard when you're sitting there going to work every day and you're doing something to believe that what you're doing could literally be obsolete in six months. But I've seen that happen now over 17 years, over and over, and I've seen it accelerate and accelerate, uh, which just necessitates, um, it doesn't just necessitate keeping up, it necessitates changing how your brain works. And that's the really hard part. Over the last three or four years, you've just been inundated with people talking about social media and how social media is going to change the world and how you have to know social media. And there are definitely people out there who just intuitively get it, and they know what to do, and they know how to turn social media into marketing. Most people don't. And most people, I would hazard, over than, older than 30 have to really think hard about it. And it's because their brain's wired a certain way. But, and I think that's the scary thing going forward, but it's also where the opportunity lies, which is that if you can recognize the world's changing and you can recognize that, you have, you're, that your brain is hardwired a certain way and that it needs to change and take the steps you need to take to change, then I think you can adjust to the way the world's going to be. And if you don't, um, you better have a trust fund in Jackson Hole. Another trend I want to talk about that I don't think gets anywhere near as much attention as it deserves is what Google has done to both media, uh, what it's done to, to, yeah, is that a question back there? No, sorry. It's a re reflection of blonde hair that looks like an arm. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, Google basically has created incentives for content to be trivialized um, and for it to just be actually, I mean, there are big companies now dedicated to writing or filming content for the Internet that is based solely on the idea of getting people to look at it via Google. It's not based on what's relevant. It's not based on what's going on in society. It's based on what people search for. And what that has done, and this, this I put eHow up there because it's a classic example. This site exists for no reason except to provide content that will score high on Google searches and then sell advertising to that audience. It's not, it's not there because somebody thought it would be an interesting idea to do a website about how to do things. It's there to get eyeballs as quickly as possible. And what that means is that in the world I live in, which is internet publishing and, and internet media and advertising, suddenly if you're asking somebody to write something, write an article, you actually have to go to Google first and look up what keywords are being searched by people and make sure you put those keywords into your article. Find some way to shoehorn them in. Because if you don't do that, Google says, what you're doing is not relevant, and therefore nobody will see it. And I think it's had a massive impact on just sort of dumbing down content and commoditizing content such that it's become harder and harder for legitimate media outlets with legitimate trained reporters to differentiate what they do from sort of all the gibberish that's out there at the same time. And the impact is, for example, 
uh, the cost of getting things written has gotten so low that it's sort of at a point where I don't think people can make a living at it. And um, because there's always somebody else who will write your blog post for $20 or $15 or $10. And, um, that's, and, and that, that is having a huge impact on general, larger media, because it's driving prices down, which means it's driving smart people out of the business. And um, it's a, it's a never-ending cycle. Now, Google, if you ask them about that, what they'll say is you should write whatever's relevant, whatever you want to write about, and everything will take care of itself. And the reality is just the opposite because the world is filled with people who are making a living gaming Google's system now. And so I don't know what to, what to do about that, but I do think it's a trend that you need to be aware of. Um, I think I covered this. Another thing that's happening in, in the content world is that an awful lot, not an awful lot, but some very smart people in Hollywood are taking much greater control over their own content. So um, this is Ashton Kutcher, who, who's an actor well-known for having been married to Demi Moore, less well-known for having invested in something like 40 startups over the last five or six years, um, has all kinds of interesting ideas about content and intellectual property and how to push things out onto the web, has zillions of followers on Twitter. Um, I just got an email. I'm a Neil Young fan. He lives like up in the woods about 25 miles that way. He's doing a Twitter conversation tomorrow to launch a new album. So at noon, if you want to talk to Neil Young on Twitter, you can go do that. Um, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty high tech for a guy who's been wandering around in, in big boots and flannel shirts for 30 years. The other thing that I, you know, I'm concerned about, everybody needs to be concerned about, is that when I when I started out in advertising, I actually went through a training program and was taught a bunch of stuff about advertising that basically other people didn't know. That you know, and I could say, "Hey, I've been to this training program. I know this stuff." Well, now the language of media and marketing and venture capital and technology has become so widespread um, that everybody's an expert. They might not be a good expert, but they're all experts. And it becomes much, much harder to sort of differentiate quality skills from from unqualified skills. You know, the classic example in my eyes is, is the, the, the title is uh, social media consultant. It's a title, a job title that did not exist five years ago. And it's a title that I now believe could be like a better proxy for the unemployment rate than the actual government numbers. I mean, basically, everybody's a social media consultant. They all know different things. Some know more, some know less. Nobody knows everything. There's no governing body to define it. Uh, and, and that's a little bit scary because you could be coming at a problem with a really good set of skills, a really good piece of knowledge, and somebody could climb out of their hot tub and compete with you uh, without, you know, without any skills whatsoever. I'm talking about Mill Valley, by the way. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, is you know, the, in terms of commoditization is, we're being dashboardized to death. To death. Um, if you're an information worker now with cloud computing and stuff like that, everything exists in some dashboard. This is actually my dashboard of dashboards. This is a dashboard I have to get to all my dashboards. Um, and I have to like, I have, I have like about 30 things like this is Salesforce that, um, you know, I, I need to understand, know how to use, uh, and, and react to and, and act upon. And on the one hand, it's wonderful that I can have all this information at my fingertips. On the other hand, I don't know the passwords to half of them, so I can't get there. <laughs> and, and it's just it's too much information. It, it's really, really easy, and I'm kind of ADD, so, you know, maybe you're not, but it's really, really easy to be distracted by some, you know, to wake up in the morning and, and see this dip and spend the whole day trying to figure out why did that go down? 
Well, that might be interesting, but it's not the most important thing I should be doing with my time. But because it's sitting there in front of me, it tends to bring it up uh, as, as uh, to appear to be something important. So I think all these dashboards have the impact of giving you more information, but at the same time, uh, they make no distinction between the information that's important and the information that isn't important. A uh, couple other things. By the way, any questions so far? A um, couple of other trends that I think are interesting uh, is kind of the, the what I call personal, professional and personal obfuscation. When we hire a contractor to work for us, I mean, it takes us about three hours before suddenly we're asking them to post something on our behalf on their Facebook page. You know, and, and um, people, you know, people's private lives and their public lives are being all mixed up and stirred together in a mess. And, and you know, it really is the case that if somebody were to go out and get all of the available data that's out there about what you've done in the last 30 days, you're spending what food you bought, which places you went to, um, they could potentially use that information to have very negative impact on your life. And, and by that I mean more than just you know, stealing your information. Um, the, the classic example would be, would be what I said before, which is, which is if Safeway told your insurance company how much bacon you were eating, the insurance company might want to raise your rate and say you have a higher risk of a heart attack. Um, for the last three years, all I've heard about has been cloud, 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 cloud this, cloud that. And I couldn't figure it out because it seemed to me that the idea of uploading your stuff to the internet had been around for 15 years. So what's the big deal? And I think the big deal that people were talking about was it made big, huge corporations able to share information better. But how it's impacted information workers really has less to do with the fact that it's all out there, but, it, but, but what's really impacted us is speed. Because it used to be that if you wanted to upload something to the internet, that would take half a minute if you wanted to download. Well now, suddenly I'm running a company and we don't have any hardware anymore. Um, we can use this thing called the cloud, which by the way is a bunch of dirty servers, um, and, and essentially negate the need for anything but a bunch of laptops and a Wi-Fi connection um, and run a business that way. And that's, it's pretty amazing how quickly that's happened.
essentially losing a battle that they didn't start. Um, and, and the people fighting the battle, sort of the, the nerds and the engineers on one side and the financial guys on the other side, don't really see themselves as in a war. But by definition, the guys on the top are very quantitative, and the guys on the bottom are sort of more left brain creative idea people. And if you're not careful, those guys will run over the market and the media guys all day long. And if you think you can operate in the world just being a marketing person or a writer or a producer of media and not understand what's going on in finance and technology, um, distribution and all those, those things, um, you're sadly mistaken. And I think that's, that's um, because the numbers are always going to win. Um, media is trivialized. Um, more and more media creators are starting to appear to be undifferentiated. Um, that's because content is following the rules. It's also because people are starting to perceive marketing as being more automated, and therefore ideas don't have a chance to percolate. Um, I think there's much more to it than this, but it's not necessarily a war that has to be lost. And I think I think the um, the uh, key to this is, is you know how, how how do you beat the world of change? And the conclusion I've come to after having been in that sort of battle is that I've simply had to work harder and make my brain work harder uh, so that I understand some of the principles of, of finance and understand how uh, I, I have to do a lot of money raising in, in, in what I'm doing now. I better understand how those VCs' heads are working because if I don't, I'm going to get slaughtered. Uh, when my CTO tells me something can't be done, I'm either uh, you know, stuck, or if I know something about databases, or I know something about the structure of the website I'm working on, I can raise my hand and say, you know, I don't know that I necessarily agree. Um, and I think it just means you have to come to the table armed. You have to be quantitative no matter how creative and less creative you are. And you also have to really come at it with a, an attitude that you're not going to be intimidated. I just won't leave the table if, not, if, if somebody can't satisfy me and explain something to me. Um, uh, you know, it's very, very easy uh, in, in the world I live in for developers and engineers to sort of dismissively say, well, we can't do that. Or if you did that, it would be this kind of thing. When I, I used to sort of let those nagging questions in the back of my head sit there and nag, and I don't want to be. Um, you have to not be intimidated and, and come at this from the, from the standpoint of uh, walking into the job. Um, don't bury your head as the world changes around you. It's, it's a great temptation, and I've seen people do it. They just bury their head and keep on doing what they're doing. And suddenly their career opportunities are really limited because they just, not only have they not changed, they've lost the capacity to change, which I think is something that you sort of have for some period of your life and then people, people give up. Um, and, uh, you know, know the numbers. Uh, and the most important thing, or one of the most important things is if you're going to live in an information world and you're going to be media marketing, there's all this information. You better be able to get your hands on what you need when you need it because that gets in the way of getting things done. It gets in the way of your ability to kind of whip carry the day in terms of arguments. So it's very um, sort of mundane piece of advice, but it's very real because there's so much information out there that if you can't find it, you just give up and, and go on. Um, so I say the good news is actually going to be much harder to go free. Um, <laughs> that is the good news. Um, but it's also true the world's being reinvented right now. I mean, we're, you know, 15 years into the commercial internet. That's not actually a lot of time, and it changes every day. 
and, and there's only so much that numbers can do. Um, figuring out human psychology and making judgments about what's relevant and what's not is, um, it can be commoditized up to a point, but, but publishers and marketing people and producers of content at the end of the day are going to create new things. And that's where the fun lies. It's going to be in a lot of distributed in different ways. It's going to make money in different ways. But um, it's really sort of nothing but opportunity in front of us. It's just going to be a sort of much wilder ride, much, much more sort of riskier existence. So that's what I have to say tonight. Um, I hope that's helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. Bruce, you uh, are probably aware that uh, Newsweek has just announced that they're no longer uh, going to be printing the magazine starting in the first of the year. What's your thoughts on on uh, the impact of new media and, and you know the, the change in? So we, uh, Colin's introduction listed this variety, this this wild ride you've had in the last 20, 25 years. <laughs> Is there a common thread? Is there just something, some something you just absolutely were trying to find out and that made you make the choices you made to with your uh, your yeah, companies? I, I think um, honestly, I, I started out as a hockey broadcaster. When I graduated from college, I wanted to get into the media, sort of more on the content side. And a bunch of people I went to talk to in New York City when I graduated misinterpreted this and pointed me towards media planning in an advertising And suddenly that's where I found myself. And I guess one way to look at this thread is, is as a a constant 30-year push to get back into the content and publishing side, which is, which is where I now am, um, and, and it's fun, but it's hard. Okay, so I know that there's a lot of uh, students in the room, so I'm my question's kind of on their behalf, and I'm interested to know, um, 
if you are a mass comm graduate and you don't have much experience and you have, let's say, a pretty slim budget, how do you distribute your marketing efforts? How much goes into your SEO? How much goes into your your uh, traditional publication, hard copy publication? So if you're marketing yourself or you're marketing a business? A business. Yeah. So the reality is that um, you need to do three things first. And the, the corollary to that is the three things, which are SEO and, and uh, blogging and all that kind of stuff, may or may not get you far. Um, and uh, so, you know, if you read the trade press and the marketing communications press, what you'll read is that social media is the answer to actually everything, and sprinkle a little SEO in, and, and you're on your way. And I can tell you that that's just not the case. Um, one of the one of the interesting and difficult things about the way the world works now not true about the way it was 30 years ago, is we knew that if we spent, um, you know, if we bought 200 gross rating points of TV in Buffalo, we would sell X number of cases of toothpaste in Buffalo. And therefore, if we did the same thing in Cleveland, we could expect roughly the same result. That doesn't really work anymore. Just because something worked over here doesn't mean it's going to work over there. Um, and an awful lot of the social media success stories that you read about, the ones that get the press, actually have a whole lot of regular media money behind them. So, um, you know, I think you have no choice but to spend your money on the free stuff, meaning this, which isn't free. You have to work really, really hard to do social media and SEO and figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, uh, but the hard part about spending it on media is once it's spent, it's gone. At least when you're doing your own thing, there's there's no end to your capacity to really burn out. Are ad blockers for you a problem? And if yes, uh, what do you? Ad blockers are they a problem for you? Because more and more people use ad blockers, and what you do again? Well, they're, they're not a problem for me because I don't do that anymore. But they don't seem to be a big issue in general. The bigger issue is how do you make internet advertising work? You know, as we've gone from big sites out of motion TV commercials down to the little tiny banners and text ads, the value of an eyeball has gone down dramatically. So the bigger challenge is how can you increase the value of the media? And if you do that, you might get to a point where the advertising becomes so interesting you don't want to block it. And I don't know what the latest number is. I think it's like 20, 25 percent use ad bloggers. Um, and I think everybody's just kind of accepted that that's out there and they just go about their business anyway. I, 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 you know, in, your, in the chapter that you're featured in Internet Ad Pioneers, you kind of talk about early banner ads having click-through rates of like 20 percent. You know, and you had these kind of interactive ads, and in, in the early internet, the ads are almost kind of a feature themselves, you know. With, with, you know, so much on SEO and, you know, Google AdSense, and you have the two lines of text, and that's what you get as your advertisement. Has kind of the art gone out of internet advertising for a large part? Is it just, is it so quantitative now? Traditional advertising agencies, which did TV and which did print, um, just didn't want to do banners. And over the last five or six years, I've actually done a lot of consulting to traditional agencies that have acquired or built digital capabilities. And classically, what happens when you walk through the door is you can tell in five minutes what's going on, which is that. The traditional advertising creative people who've been raised to believe that it's all about the idea and and the uh, emotion that you can generate. First off, they don't want to do it banners because they're boring. Second, they want to take that emotional piece and apply it to the internet. And and they want to say, 
do it because I'm a creative director and I'm paid half a million dollars a year, so therefore it must be true. And then they get slaughtered by the numbers. And so I think the answer is the fun part of doing TV commercials and stuff like that is just not to be found in doing internet advertising. It's absolutely a far more fun activity. It, that doesn't mean it's less creative. It means that it's a different kind of creativity. There's actually a lot of interesting stuff you can do around researching keywords and figuring out what works, but you sort of have to, at some level, be a numbers You want to do that. One and one. One last question. Bruce, you mentioned that uh, Google is ruining content, and I... I agree with you what's the what's the solution is there one you know i think the solution is to do what google tells you to do um and that's all well and good until you're actually you know trying to sell x number of widgets or of course come up or sell you know or get x million people to look at your website um you know quality rises to the top i mean the, the big brand names are still big brand names. Fortune and Time and USA Today. They have the distribution, they have the brand name to begin with, but there's plenty of ways that they could have and did step in. But there's still some level of trust that if you read it on USA Today or the New York Times, that it has some chance of being true and being written by somebody who knows what they're talking about. But it's... it's um, the problem is if you're using Google to find content, no matter what they do, you're going to find crap because the crap follows the algorithm. And it's, it's I don't know, you know, the solution may have to wait until Google doesn't have an 80% share of the searches. All right, we'd like to, sir, thank you for your time. here in this room, uh, Engineering 189, in case you forgot where you were, and it's going to be a Lagos Cavern, a social media specialist at SAP, will be part of